morning on this Father's Day, I'm going to be talking about how we raise our sons. And as a lead into my message later on, I want to read to you just a short excerpt from a blog post that I read a couple of weeks ago, written by a woman by the name of Courtney Meeker. She is a playwright and a marketing director who lives in Seattle, Washington. And she walks to and from work every day. She walks everywhere, and she runs as well. And she describes her experiences while walking in a blog that she entitled, Walking While Fat and Female. <laughs> it's not a funny topic, unfortunately. So this blog recently ran in the Huffington Post, and I urge you to read the whole thing, but here is an excerpt. She talks about the harassment that she experiences during her walking, and she uses explicit language. I'll let you read that yourselves, but here is something of the conclusion. She writes, I'm sick of it. I'm sick of not feeling like I can say anything to the idiots that yell at me, like I can't react, and that I can't even share that this experience happens daily with supposed allies. Not all men shout at me from cars, but the ones that do shout at me, the ones that do shout at me are the ones that make it unsafe to walk in my city. And you telling me that not all men do not do that doesn't make my walk or drive or existence safer. It makes it more challenging to say this happened and it was wrong. It makes it harder to call out this behavior for what it is, misogynistic, sexist, rape culture, excuse me, bullshit behavior. I don't care that not all men are like this. I care that it happens, that it continues to happen, that it's common, that it's so common that when I hear a woman start talking about it with other women, those women can point to at least one similar incident that's happened to them in the past two years. So a preliminary note or two. First I want to acknowledge that the following contains references to men and women, boys and girls, that assumes a gender binary perspective, that either you are a man or a woman. And I want to acknowledge that this perspective is an incomplete and inadequate representation of the complexity of gender identity, which we now know is fluid and more like a spectrum than an either or. Second, and similarly, when I use terms like men and women, I'm referring to what have been considered historically heterosexual or straight individuals, also called cisgendered, those who are attracted to members of the so-called opposite sex. Like gender, we know that sexual attraction and preference is equally as complex as gender and does not strictly fall into this binary division as we once thought. So with that in mind, I want to read you a letter I've written to my grandson, Matthew. Dear Matthew, I was there. I was there three weeks ago when you were born. I wasn't in the room with you. Your mother wasn't comfortable having her father in the delivery room. She gave that honor to your mother, your Grammy. But I was there. I was there. I was standing at the nurse's station, which was right outside the delivery room door, and I heard your first cries. It took all my might to stay put and not burst through that door and meet you. Hearing your strong, loud cries as you entered the world, I thought my heart would leap out of my chest. And when I met you a short time later, later at the time it felt like an eternity, you were pinky purple and wrinkly and beautiful, and the old waterworks opened up. Welcome to the Heartstrong family, Maddie. Being in the baby bubble for those first few days after you were born, shuttling back and forth from your parents' house to the hospital, I didn't hear the news of what happened until later. But it happened the day after you were born. Yet another mass murder. This time it was in the town of Isla Vista, California, 
Elliott, home of the University of California at Santa Barbara. Elliot Roger, a 22-year-old man, went on a rampage and killed six people and injured seven more. Maybe by the time you're old enough to read this letter and understand this, easy access to guns and ammunition will be a thing of the past. I, I pray that it is so. But these days, there are mass killings, mostly by men and boys with guns, on what seems like a weekly basis. Many of those shootings happen in schools, and it makes me wonder whether homeschooling is the best way to keep you safe. But that's another matter for another time. What made this particular killing spree different is that Elliot Roger was out specifically targeting women. In this narcissistic age of endless selfies, we know this because he recorded a video before he did it, handing us his motive on a silver platter. This young man was looking for revenge. He was looking for revenge against women because they denied him sex, and revenge against the men who were more successful with those women. He was out to prove that he was better, a better man, than all of them. Here are just a couple of sentences from that video. I don't know why you girls aren't attracted to me, but I will punish you all for it. I am going to enter the hottest sorority house of UCSB, and I will slaughter every single spoiled, stuck-up blonde slut I see inside there. All those girls that I have desired so much, you will finally see that I am the superior one, the true alpha male. Maddie, here's a new vocabulary word for you. Misogyny. Misogyny is the hatred or distrust of women. Misogyny is what killed all those people the day after you were born. And it's pervasive in our society today, crippling and killing both women and men, not just physically, but emotionally and spiritually as well. Maybe by the time you're old enough to read and understand this misogyny, like easy access to guns and ammo will also be a thing of the past. I pray that it is so, but I'm not optimistic. I used to think that the generation succeeding my own work was doing so much better than we did. Your mother and father's generation seemed so much more open about issues of sexual orientation and race than we ever were, and it gave me hope. But Elliot Rogers' killing spree and the response to it makes me wonder, at least about how we're doing the very basic area of relationships between men and women. You see, Maddie, shortly after the killings, a new hashtag, hashtag trended on Twitter. Do they have, still have Twitter by the time you're reading this? The hashtag was, yes, all women. What the Isle of Vista killings did, what this guy's misogynist rant on the video did, was to unleash a wave, a tsunami of disclosure by women who have been mistreated, threatened, assaulted, and raped by men who felt entitled to have sex with them. The hashtag, yes, all women, went viral, and within a couple of days of the shooting, millions, millions of women had shared their experiences of violence at the hands of men. Yes, all women laid bare a nasty secret that roughly half the population, meaning all the men, nearly half the population either actively denies or is blissfully ignorant of the reality that every woman in America, or maybe even on the planet, has been somehow, at some time, harassed or worse by a man or men during their lifetimes. And that an overwhelming portion of women in our society live in fear for their very lives on a daily basis, threatened by men they know and those they don't. One tweet on Yes All Women pointed out, the odds of being attacked by a shark are one in three million, while a woman's odds of being raped in her lifetime are one in six. Fear of sharks is considered normal. Misogyny, Maddie. Misogyny is rampant in our culture and it poisons our homes, our schools, our places of work, and the streets we 
walk on every day, as we heard in our reading this morning. Feminist writer Margaret Atwood puts it this way. Men are afraid women will laugh at them. Women are afraid that men will kill them. Similarly, describing the difference between men and women who use online dating services like eHarmony and Match.com, one study reported, surveys show that in the online dating world, women are afraid of meeting a serial killer. Men are afraid of meeting someone fat. As you might suspect, Maddie, guess all women, that hashtag met with a strong backlash, but it came from an unlikely source. Good men, good men like me, and I hope like you, those of us who treat women with respect, those who would never raise a hand, those who go out of our way to share power and authority and wealth with women as equals, we reacted very poorly. We said, wait a minute. What about us? You can't lump us in with the Elliot Rodgers of the world. And a counter hashtag arose in response to Yes All Women. It was the hashtag Not All Men. This was my first reaction too. I admit, I was defensive. I didn't want to see myself as part of the problem. But as they say, if you're not part of the solution, I used to think it was just a problem of our persistent patriarchy, that women continue to be treated unfairly by men and still hold on to the reins of power. But this, this goes beyond issues of equal pay for equal work and glass ceilings yet to be shattered. This is so much deeper than that. As Alexandra Petrie wrote about on the Yes All Women hashtag, and the tweets in the Washington Post, she said, the sheer number of stories is what makes them powerful and unsettling. The snowballing effect of shared story after shared story keeps the hashtag rolling, the sense that everyone knows what you're talking about and can relate. Everyone does. The resounding, yes, that happened to me, yes, that feeling is comforting and empowering online. But when you consider its implications for what women face every day in the world, it's chilling. This, Maddie, this is when I started to get it. Reading the Yes All Women tweets and blogs written by women with titles like Walking While Fat and Female, and sex educator Lacey Green's 70 out of 71 mass murders in the past 30 years have something in common. That was the title of her blog, and I'll give you a hint. That thing in common is that they were all men, and mostly white men. And I saw that while I'm not a misogynist myself, Maddie, I do contribute to this thing that some are calling rape culture. And I'm writing you this letter because I want to be, and I want you to be part of the solution. I'm thinking that there are lots of fathers and grandfathers out there who are equally horrified as me about this and that they worry for how we're raising our sons and our grandsons too. The problem starts with the objectification of women. Our culture is immersed in it. It's normalized and unavoidable. Watch almost any television show any television commercial, listen to almost any country song, look at the cover of almost every magazine at the checkout counter, and you'll see what I mean. Women aren't treated or depicted as subjects, as people, as individuals with power and agency. They're depicted as objects to be acted upon. In the time when I grew up, this was considered normal. Listen to the language we used to use. Women were the objects of our affection, the objects of our desire, the objects of our fantasy. All you have to do is take a look at the Barbie doll, or the old pinup girls, or Marilyn Monroe, and you see what I mean. And now, now with such easy access to pornography all over the internet, the image of women as sexual objects is even more pervasive. And it's more
more real than when I was a pubescent boy sneaking peeps at my father's Playboy magazines. Seeing women as objects, and more specifically as sex objects, denies women their personhood. It reduces them to nothing more than the sum of their parts, their breasts, their butts, their lips, their legs. Maggie, I don't know how to say this any more simply than this. Women are people, too. They're not playthings put here for our pleasure. Then there's the problem with how we define masculinity in our culture. Maybe this will change in the next dozen years or so, but I'm not so sure, given where we are today. In our culture, masculinity is aligned with words like strong, powerful, tough, aggressive. What does it mean to be a man in our culture? Frankly, Maddie, I hoped it was changing. I grew up in a time where the roles of men and women were at first very clear. Men brought home the bacon and women fried it up in a pan. The man was the breadwinner and the disciplinarian, while the woman was the homemaker and nurturer. All this changed, changed for the better. And it was for me sort of a midstream with the emergence of feminism in the 1960s and 70s. And I adapted as best I could. I think your Grammy and I were pretty good role models for your mom and Aunt Julia. We didn't stick to traditional sexual stereotypes. We shared in parenting duties. We both contributed to the family's financial well-being. I was even a stay-at-home dad with your mom after she was born, while Grammy went back to work. I thought, as a society, we were making progress, and that men, in general, were becoming more sensitive, more caring, more thoughtful, and less of the John Wayne movie types. And if you don't know, Maddie, who John Wayne is, you can Google it or do whatever you do these days. You'll see what I mean. Come to find out. We are not as far along this path toward expanding what it means to be a man as I thought. That's one of the lessons that I've learned from the hashtag, yes, all women. There are still way too many men out there who believe that to be a man, you've got to be tough. You've got to be the aggressor. You've got to be ready to fight for what you want or think you deserve. That men have the right to dominate and control women. This understanding is reinforced by so many of our institutions, mass media, professional sports, even some religious denominations. As Lacey Green has put it, masculinity requires that men repress their emotions so they don't appear weak. They use women for sex. They appear physically intimidating. It also urges men to solve their problems and garner respect for the aggression. It's like Elliot Rogers said in his manifesto, you've got to prove that you're the real alpha man. And as you learn from all the tweets on yes, all women, it's a small step from aggression to violence. Maddie, I want to say this about this definition of masculinity. It is hurtful, and it's harmful, and it's wrong. It's dangerous, and it's deadly. Not only does it perpetuate a dangerous and violent stereotype that, as we see from Isla Vista and Yes All Women, perpetuates violence towards women, it's hurtful and harmful and dangerous for men, too. It denies you and me our full humanity. If to be a man you've got to be only a certain way, tough, aggressive, unemotional, think how much of your personhood that prevents you from expressing. We're not allowed to be vulnerable. We're not allowed to be sensitive. We've got to man up and soldier on. I remember a book that came out a long time ago with the title, Real Men Need to Teach. What that title tells us is that men can be tough and tender. They can be powerful and gentle. They can be sensitive, caring, whole human beings. And of course, so can women be both and be whole. 
If we all just would allow ourselves to express our wholeness to each other, well, then the world would be a far more peaceful place. So don't bury your emotions, Maddie. Don't think you have to be a certain way to be a man. Just strive to always be fully who you are, and you'll be just fine. And you'll be loved and respected for it, at least by the people who matter. And then there's this whole issue of entitlement, which is part of how we define masculinity, and it's tied to the objectification of women. Many men in our society seem to think that they are entitled to the attention and the sexual response of women. Entitled to it. That somehow, just because we're men, we deserve sex. My colleague Lynn Hunger writes, Elliot Rogers felt entitled to sexual attention from women, and his fury came not from the fact that beautiful women were beyond his reach, but rather from the fact that he wasn't getting the women he felt he was supposed to get. So you see how this is tied to the objectification of women, but it goes beyond that. It says that women have a duty, an obligation, to satisfy men's sexual needs, desires, and fantasies. And when they don't, we're justified in being resentful, angry, and even violent. Maddie, you are a child of many privileges. There is no doubt about that. You will grow up with a roof over your head and food on your table. You have a family who loves you. You will likely receive a good education. You are white and male. Don't mistake these privileges or entitlements. You didn't earn any of this, and you don't somehow deserve them. You're a very fortunate person to be born who you are, with who your parents are, and what they provide you. And just because you're male doesn't mean that you deserve sex from women, or from men for that matter, that others have an obligation somehow to satisfy your personal needs. The pleasures and the privileges of healthy sexual relationships have to be earned through trust, mutual affection, and mutual respect. And I can tell you from experience that relationships based on these principles are a whole lot more satisfying, sustaining, and sustainable than those based on some sense of entitlement, control, or power. Maddie, I know that Elliot Roger is an extreme example of the horrors that misogyny can wreak. Thankfully, that it's true that not all men are like him. But, to varying degrees, we all have it in us to be jerks, or worse, or women. Perhaps it's part of our DNA, but I think it's more likely a result of how we're raised and the signals that society sends us. Again, sex educator Lacey Green tells us that Elliot is the monster that we as a culture, as a society, have created. His terrifying acts are not random, isolated occurrences. They are part of a serious cultural illness that affects all of us, especially women, every single day. And she's right. Lacey Green is right. So here's the deal, Maddie. Let's you and I be countercultural. Let's be a cure to this illness. Let's show the world that there's a different and better way to be men. Let's fight for a feminism that empowers not just women, but men, too, to be fully and holy themselves, equal in every way.